Welcome everyone. Welcome to the first session on crosstalks, the topic heavy conversations about light metals. My name is Bridget Farah, Managing Director at the Metallurgy and Materials Society of CIM. Before we begin, a few housekeeping notes. This session will be split into two parts. The first part being a 50 minute panel discussion with our speakers, after which we will split into breakout rooms where you'll be able to have one-on-one -on -one discussions with the speakers. Please keep note that this meeting is being recorded. So we ask that you stay on mute at all times to avoid disruptions. If during this session you have any questions, please use the chat box to send your inquiries. We will keep the inquiries and we'll review these questions during the breakout sessions. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the Light Metals Section Chair of the METSOC Board of Directors, Dr. Sumant Shankar. Over to Thank you, Sumant. Thank you, Bridget. Hello, good day to you all. Uh, before we move on to the proceedings today, I would like to first uh, present a land acknowledgement, and uh, which would be, and just to recognize the, the land in which I came as a guest, and I would like to recognize and acknowledge that I personally live and work on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee. Haudenosaunee nations and within the land of the protect, that is protected by the dish with one spoon wampum agreement, uh, which we all share uh, in the land and in taking only what we need. As a guest to this land, I would like to remind all of us that in order to end the violence prejudice that continues, we need to take action and step towards and do the work towards the truth and reconciliation. With that in context, I would like to start bringing in a little bit of my personal context into this crosstalks, which is basically coming from India, uh, the thoughts of decolonization and moving forward as a, a collaborative society with equity and with inclusivity. We started thinking about things coming out of this COVID scenario to uh, engage people immediately in sort of a dialogue so that we can all come within the vein of this industry and our lives can be reset with very critical focus from direct conversations. And that is the idea of bringing in panel discussions so that we can directly engage people who have been working through these crazy times and who have been at the forefront of some of these technological advancements that we are gonna be again coming into. We would like to know as professionals what our chances are and where we can position ourselves to make our career and future bright. So with that context, we want to create an informal discussion amongst industry personnel that are interested to work within the group of metallurgy and materials and manufacturing within the light metal society. And today we want to actually participate in a true knowledge transfer where we can all go back with gaining some improved understanding of our career and our uh, you know, industry and our life itself in, in, in terms of the global sense of uh, uh, camaraderie. So in doing this, I would like to now introduce the, 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 uh, the host and the curators of the first cross talk, who happen to be wonderful personnel, two wonderful personalities. And in, in doing so, I'd also like to introduce the fact that we are now creating a, a group of uh, people so that they can they can come out as emerging professionals supported by the MetSoc community so that they can have a further direction and we can all, already see them contribute to our professional community at large. And Jessica Hiscock, who is presently at the Kingston Process Metallurgy Center, is, is, is here uh, along with Abdullah El Syed who's an assistant professor at the University of Guelph. Just for a quick background, uh, Abdullah, come, I know Abdullah for a very long time since his undergraduate days in Ryerson, his alma mater is Ryerson University, and he's been working in aluminum casting technologies uh, with, with NEMAC after his PhD there from 2015 to 2017, and he started recently as a faculty in the University of Guelph. Moving forward, he's actually a very avid hiker and camper and, 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 and recently getting into Formula One racing. Maybe, get his blood rushing again. And, uh, and so he's a very, very 
uh, interesting personality, along with Jessica, who is a, a metallurgist and a metallographer fundamentally, and, and started a career with extrusion companies in the, in the nuclear and in process development. And, and recently uh, she moved on to uh, advanced EBSD analysis and software developments, and also newly working on initializing new aluminum casting facilities for custom DC billet. So she's an extremely uh, adept person. And, and technically, she's a carpenter, a an expert in plumbing, and an expert in automotive electrical and mechanical. So she is an absolutely fabulous personality co-hosting this and curating this with Abdullah. So without much, much further ado, I want to welcome you all to Crosstalk. And please, Abdullah and Jessica, take over. Thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction, Suman. Um, very nice to meet you all. So my name is Abdullah Al Sayed. Um, myself and Jessica, we when we were um, came as emerging professionals, we were thinking we wanted to have some kind of event we wanted to run for our MedSoc members and the community at large, and we wanted to do something different. We were um, very, you know, we were going through the routine of the online lectures and online talks because of uh, COVID. So we thought we wanted to do something different, and we came up with the idea with a panel discussion. Um, we then sp spoke to the Light Metals Group uh, members and asked them what topics they thought would be interesting to, to hear about. And one of the topics, or one theme that came up quite a bit was aluminum casting in, in North America. So Jessica and I, we went, um, we started to curate this talk. We looked for experts, and I think we have great three uh, panel experts we have today. Um, we could give you a really nice overview of aluminum casting and the aluminum industry in North America. Um, so I hope you enjoy this event as much as we enjoyed putting it together. And just to look a little bit further ahead at our next crosstalk, the working title for that one is Digital Tools for Light Metals Development and Process Optimization. This is uh, an emerging area of the aluminum industry working on the intersection between computer programming and materials engineering, which I think will be very interesting. Now I'd like to introduce our first panelist. If we can get his bio up. Perfect. Uh, Francois Racine is currently president of ALU Quebec, an organization dedicated to fostering connections between the aluminum industry stakeholders. Uh, he specializes in analysis and development of business strategy for aluminum companies. And in the past, he has worked extensively for Alcoa, a major aluminum primary producer. He has a master's in business administration. Now Abdallah will introduce the next two panelists. So our second panelist is Corey Vian uh, from Stellantis. Uh, so Corey is currently manufacturing engineering manager. Um, die casting tool and process, as well as additive manufacturing at Salinas for the past three years. Um, I want to congratulate Corey. He, he told us that he recently received his PhD just um, a few uh, months ago in mechanical engineering from uh, Purdue University. Um, so we're very happy to have Corey on board as well. And then our final panelist is Dr. Robert McKay um, at NEMAC Canada Corporation. So Dr. McKay is a licensed professional engineer. Uh, working 20 years as a principal metallurgist at NEMAC. Um, he's also heavily involved with the Detroit Windsor American Foundry Society um, and was also chair of that uh, organization for multiple years. Um, many co authored papers and as well as conference presentations and one textbook. Um, and then he has his education from institutes all over Canada from Windsor, uh, McGill, and Memorial University and University of Prince Edward Island. So I think going through our bio, going through the bios for our panelists, now we could start going right deep into the questions. So my first question, or the first question to the entire panel, but maybe I'll direct it directly to Rob first. Um, okay, um, so Rob, uh, what aluminum casting product sectors, for example, electric vehicles, renewables, net zero technology, do you feel are emerging? And what are some of the resulting effects? Uh, thanks, Abdullah, and, and thanks everybody who's joining on the panel. Um, I'm happy to be here. Uh, what's emerging, particularly in automotive aluminum castings, uh, 
basically the, the first, uh, basically two sectors. One is the battery electric vehicle segments where uh, companies like ours are moving, we're still doing engine blocks, cylinder heads, transmission housings and so forth, but we are moving into battery trays, uh, e-motor housings uh, and et cetera to, to support the, the growing market. Um, that's probably the biggest thing. Uh, and just to throw out some numbers, I mean, 2019, the world made 98 million vehicles. It's projected by 2029, uh, these are projections, of course, that the world uh, output for vehicles will be about 127 million. Uh, for battery electric vehicles, we're looking at about 2 million on the 2019 number. When you get to the 2029, 2020, uh, 20, uh, 2030 uh, timeframe, of that about 127 million vehicles world, made worldwide, 26 will be full battery electric with another 20 to 30 that will be hybrids. Um, so the uh, industry is growing uh, significantly over time. Keep in mind, there's a lot of countries, this is not the case here in North America, but there's Europe, China, India, um, there's government legislations right now and what the percentage of uh, hybrid or, or full battery electric vehicles has to be. Uh, so the industry is moving towards developing its proficiency in casting from all the casting processes, high pressure die casting, all the way to precision sand uh, to support that. The other area that is growing is the growing use of structural aluminum components in, in the automobile because light weighting is obviously not only important for internal gas combustion engines, but is also important for the hybrids and the battery electric vehicles because one of the, one of the main components to get around uh, range anxiety is to lighten the vehicle uh, further. Uh, so there's a lot of things like ABC pillars um, uh, and other stress sh shock towers, et cetera, that are now growing more in aluminum and in high pressure die casting. Um, and so the forecast for the aluminum uh, content in vehicles is just has been climbing for the last 25 years, and it's just going to keep it keep climbing. Uh, so there's going to be a greater demand on aluminum going forward in the future. And then finally, uh, particularly for students to be uh, cognizant of this, um, whether it's aluminum or other materials, there is a growing trend for additive manufacturing. Now, additive manufacturing has challenges, but there's significant carrots at the end of the road, particularly in serial automotive uh, production, like what you see going on at BMW. They just reached 300,000 additive parts uh, in their 2020. Uh, actually, so during the pandemic, they, they literally have increased and they're, they're planning to go between 350 to 400 this year. Um, light weighting is one big factor with, with uh, additive. And so that is an emerging trend. It's happening now. Uh, several OEMs, uh, Mercedes, Porsche, uh, for example, have been very public about uh, their growth into additive. It is a very small segment, but that would be the other uh, avenue that uh, is growing. And particularly uh, 10 years from now, uh, we'll begin to see that there's going to be more than the small number of vehicles that do have additive parts that is just gonna that's going to continually grow not only for manufacturing footprint because there's an impact there uh, but there's also a weight savings that uh, particularly for battery electric vehicle um, addressing the range anxiety uh, uh, issues or improving that solid state batteries which is emerging which has got more range so it's not using aluminum to uh, lightweight the vehicle is not the only thing, but it is a major component. So that, that's basically what I would say is what the emerging uh, sectors are uh, for aluminum in the in particular for the automotive space. Mm -hmm. Maybe if Corey or Francois want to chime in too, where they've heard other um, kind of big demand for aluminum. 
I can if you want, and uh, uh, and then I guess Corey will have something to say. But uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, as was said in the early introduction, I mean, I'm not a casting expert, but I've been in the industry long enough. And I have a pretty good uh, view of the, the global industry, uh, having worked in uh, the global strategy of Alcoa. And uh, uh, just to uh, complete on what uh, Rob was saying about the automotive uh, industry trend, uh, with the introduction of more EVs and the decline of thermal engine, the profile of parts that are uh, made from castings obviously will change uh, thermal block uh, or thermal engines obviously uh, that are cast uh, will slowly disappear and be replaced by other parts that are, will be used for uh, trays and uh, uh, basically enclosure for the, uh, the, the batteries. But again, in the quest for lightweighting, uh, it is expected that the use of extrusions and sheets will grow even faster and that will be a major player. And the impact that it will have is the change in the profile of scrap that will be generated. And when we're talking about using more uh, or greener aluminum and increasing the recycling rate, uh, in the next few years, we actually uh, anticipate a potential uh, uh, excess or surplus of uh, basically a scrap from cast apart and basically surplus of Twitch and Zorba, which is basically the low grade uh, aluminum scrap uh, for which uh, we will have to find a better way of using them. And I think for a metallurgist, this will be a very great uh, challenge. And as I said, because of the change in the profile of the aluminum parts that will be used in the future in EVs, uh, the input of scrap uh, will have to be addressed and uh, that could be a challenge. And again, I'm not the, um, uh, the expert in metallurgy, but I mean, this is something that has been coming up uh, more and more in recent years. So challenge, but also an opportunity uh, in terms of making greener products. Yes, definitely. I mean, I'll echo uh, really what uh, Rob and Francois said. It's uh, large, large growth in the use of aluminum and automobiles from, from structural battery electrics. Hybrids, definitely. When you take a look at that, you're essentially carrying two powertrains in your vehicle. So you, you essentially double the amount of mm -hmm. aluminum powertrain castings that are there. So, so through this transition period of however long it is, you know, there's arguments 10 years, 20 years, 30, and it's going to be different for, for different regions for, for sure. Um, massive growth in, in the use of aluminum. Um, another really light metal um, that's having a bit of a resurgence is magnesium as well. And we see that uh, within our company with uh, specifically Thixo molding, um, a technology where you don't have to um, handle molten magnesium within your plant. Uh, it's really a combination of injection molding and and uh, magnesium die casting, and, and it is starting to make its way back into to our vehicle portfolio as well. Okay, great. No, thanks for the overview from all three of you. I think now Jessica will go over the second question. Yeah, um, I'm gonna direct this to Corey. So what would you say, what kinds of opportunities and careers does a graduate degree open up in the aluminum casting industry? Well, I mean, right off the bat, having a graduate degree and having an understanding of how to structure your problem solving um, gives you a leg up in the world of metal casting. It's a very complex process, uh, many variables acting simultaneously. So, so having that understanding of how to isolate variables and make sound decisions, um, whether that's in the world of design or process engineering, um, designing alloys, et cetera, instantly gives you a leg up over over some others uh, um, really though also within the world of metal casting you can be studying really anything um, at, at your university we need people that are metallurgists we need mechanicals we need electricals automation specialists we need business specialists supply chain managers um, we need people that are really educators and people development there's there's a there's something for everybody in the world of metal casting, and the farther that you can take your education, um, you can become a specialist in one area. But but really, just learning how to to be a scientist, how to structure experiments, work through your problems, and make sound decisions is is just a huge benefit for for all of us in the metal casting industry. 
Um, within our plant uh, and within our company, we, we highly encourage, um, we might bring somebody that's entry level um, with a bachelor's, we encourage them to go back to school. We help um, pay for tuition, et cetera, because we want to develop um, those problem solving um, abilities and that, that scientific uh, scientist mentality, if you will, um, to bring those abilities to our, to our company. Rob, uh, Francois, do you have anything to add to that? Um, uh, yeah, I'll just, I'll just jump in. I think what the other thing that's, that would be important um, with graduate degrees is, is perhaps with students also getting involved with um, student chapters of NACA, AFS, et cetera. There's scholarship opportunities and you're able to network better and you can be like me. I was a student with my AFS chapter. And then when I became salaried, I uh, stayed with the chapter and then in turn helped other students uh, with scholarships and stuff like that. And AFS did play an important role in helping further my exposure um, with things, with uh, networking, even, even working now as I have for, at NEMAC for 20 years, Sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll end up crossing paths with somebody um, or you'll find co-op students and, and you get a chance to talk to them and, and, and so forth. So uh, that, that's also an important factor. Yeah, and I will add to what uh, Rob was saying. I mean, networking, obviously, if you wanna get, have a better idea of what's going on in the industry and also, uh, I guess, share the experience of the experts, uh, I mean, there's all sorts of contests. In fact, we just had one last weekend, which was uh, basically open for all university students uh, in Quebec. It was a design contest on uh, architectural, uh, civil engineering and design. And it was basically a design contest, but uh, experts from the industry were there to network with the student and support them. And I mean, the feedback from the student was that they probably learned more during that weekend than they did uh, over a year, uh, you know, sitting uh, behind a desk. I mean, working on a specific project and sharing feedback with uh, with experts. Uh, the other thing I, I would add, I mean, we're dearly looking for experts like, uh, I mean, those who are studying in science. And in fact, one of our challenges is to attract more science students and show them how, I mean, what are the, the opportunities uh, that are offered for them in our industry. And some are dearly concerned about the environment. I mean, our industry is concerned with the environment and there's a lot of challenges and a lot of opportunity for those who are concerned and want to get involved in making our industry greener through recycling to uh, basically lower carbon footprint uh, parts. And so, I mean, and, and I know a lot, many of the youth are very much concerned about you know the future of the environment and our industry is and for those who are and want to commit themselves to work uh, on that path I mean there's so many opportunities uh, there I mean and to satisfy someone's uh, ambitions. Sounds great. I'll let uh, Abdallah handle the next question. So I, I think it, it segues nicely to the next question. Um, so we need all these people coming in. Um, and so what hurdles do you see in terms of diversity, accessibility, and moving towards inclusiveness? Um, can we address these problems? Maybe we'll start with Francois. Yeah, well, uh, it's sort of a paradox. I mean, looking at the state of the industry and the fact that, again, as I said, we're, I mean, there are shortages of experts and I mean, all sorts of labor uh, with different technical levels, but also, I mean, obviously the one coming from en uh, the en engineering programs. I mean, <laughs> the industry is basically looking for anybody who has a degree and is, I mean, <laughs> is committed to work in it. So, I mean, I would hope that the, those uh, hurdles are pretty much uh, have been put aside. I mean, and again, I'm probably not the right person to talk about that, but I mean, I know the major players, first of all, are committed to eliminate those hurdles and I mean, be as inclusive as possible. And they have all sorts of, uh, I guess, programs and targets. And I'm talking about the larger companies who are probably more visible, uh, but I mean, everyone in the industry is so badly looking for uh, qualified labor. I mean, I'm hoping that those hurdles will disappear if they have all not already. I mean, in fact, we probably need to open up uh, 
our uh, borders a little bit more. I mean, we think immigration is one key to meet the demand uh, and the shortage of uh, skilled people. Uh, and in fact, we're trying to convince the authorities to be more uh, uh, proactive in that regard because uh, we have, I mean, we know we have a de demographic uh, uh, shortage and it will just go, uh, it will worsen throughout the year. So we, we need to address it. And I think we're already a little bit late. So again, I'm hoping those hurdles are gone because I think everyone is badly needed. Everyone who's qualified is badly needed. Yeah, yeah, Robert, Corey, yeah, jump yeah. In. yep i'll jump in here um i'll say that some of these challenges of diversity are not unique to casting they're they're very the manufacturing industries as a whole has uh maybe suffered from a lack of of diversity um based off the nature of work um but we i'll say within our company we are actively recruiting um, as diverse uh, a workforce as we can. And it somewhat goes back to that, that idea of problem solving. When we can bring in diverse work groups, we can look at problems from different angles and we can attack them with the best methods and best ideas rather than getting boxed into one way of doing it. So, so it's, uh, you mentioned uh, my work with the North American Die Casting Association. We're attempting to go out and recruit uh, more females and, and minorities, et cetera, to, to come into our workforces and be a part of our problem solving and really leadership teams. Um, it makes us all better. I'll say overall, um, it, it maybe, you know, if you look at, at, at the metal casting industry and you feel it's not diverse, it's not because we, we don't want to be per se. So um, reach out to us. We, we are really an open, open group. Um, we're all in it uh, with a common goal of, of making our industry better, making each other better um, and sharing in almost, you can say the common struggles of metal casting. It's a, it's a tough industry. It's not exactly an easy one. There's plenty of challenges, but um, we definitely are good at putting our differences aside and, and forming a team around each other and, and working together towards common goals. Yeah, I can echo just very quickly too. I think one of the things that's important that what our industry is trying to do, I know at NEMAC and I know at a lot of other companies is that HR programs have active uh, inclusion and diversity training uh, that, that we, we have to go through. And I think that it's very important because, uh, you know, as we move, and first of all, mentioned, you know, uh, we hope these hurdles wouldn't be there, but the, the reality is, watch the news, it's, there's still some hurdles. And our respective organizations and, and government institutions have to just basically, for a very long time, uh, have to have a policy and a training and guidance program on diversity and inclusion, uh, just to make sure to get as many people on the same wavelength uh, as we move into the future. because you know, where we were a multicultural society, there are people and talents that you can draw from that, that industry. Um, but uh, of course, our, our respective employers spend quite a bit of time and money reinforcing that with uh, training programs and etc. So that that's something that probably, again, as Francois mentioned, do we still have this or probably because the people on this, 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 uh, expert panel session and students are probably more progressive, but that, that's not everybody that's going to be uh, in our industry. And, and um, uh, you know, so it, it, there, there's an important component of um, uh, a consistency year after year, making sure that uh, there's also a internal uh, training program on uh, diversity inclusion. Thanks for your comments, everyone. Yeah, I know I think sometimes also for me in my role, it's sometimes you're just not aware. Like I've gotten some very simple comments of just please put on captions during you know the, the lecture so that students can are able to read as well as hear you. And just things like this, you think, you know, you don't sometimes you, you're uh, no intention to, to harm anyone, but and you just see it's just very simple adjustment that everyone can do. Um, I think Jessica's gonna go for the next one, the next question. Yeah, the next question is directed at Corey um, first. So what challenges are aluminum products and 
and castings facing from the process, um, alloy, or supply side? Yeah, so um, I'll start with the powertrain castings. The quality specifications continue to get harder and harder to meet with our traditional processes. Um, you can think of uh, um, things like leakage rates on, on cooling channels within, uh, within the battery boxes. You can talk about the hydraulic fluid channels within transmission cases, the, the water jacket area of engine blocks. Every, every iteration of design, it seems like the design engineers want a, a more and more leak proof casting with less porosity in it. Um, some of these challenges are inherent in what we do, and it, it makes us attempt to look for, for new methods. Uh, we talked about additive manufacturing a little bit ago. We, um, you know, we've began to use a lot of additive manufactured uh, dye components within, within our die casting um, dyes and processes to try to uh, attack with spot cooling in certain areas. Um, we're beginning to explore again the world of semi-solid uh, metal casting, which um, is a technology that that maybe got introduced before it was maybe ready before. So, so specifically, our company is starting to to re-evaluate uh, Rio casting, um, so direct slurry methods to attempt to alleviate some of these porosity concerns. Um, and then in the world of structural castings, you know, you have to be um, crashworthy. So having very very clean alloys. Um, that are can be difficult to cast that have uh, the mechanical properties and elongation requirements needed for crash worthiness. Um, those castings continue to get larger and larger. So you take a look at at what Tesla has put online with their mm. um, giant die casting machine and that giant casting. You you imagine um, it, it's difficult to make a small die casting, let alone one that's uh, essentially a third of an automobile. Um, so, so we have to continue to innovate and look for new, new um, alloys and new methods and processes, get better with our simulation techniques um, and find ways of, of moving forward uh, to meet these requirements that can continue to get tougher and tougher. Uh, Francois, Rob, any uh, input on this? Challenges that you're facing? Challenges that the industry is facing? Oh, I, I can I can be quick. Yeah, about um, yeah. I mean, as Corey mentioned, the mechanical properties and and pressure tightness and dimensional stability requirements are going up because obviously, as the aluminum intensification of the vehicle as a whole is going up, um, you, you also want to try to minimize basically the cross sectional. Um, architecture of that because that's also part of the light weighting of the vehicle that does also presents challenges in terms of porosity and so forth but um, as Corey mentioned semi-solid is one one approach that's taken um, I know in the precision sand this this is that public so I can share this example with uh, the new Corvette the new C8 that's coming out in 2023 Nemax making the block and the lower crank and uh, we have evolved, we've also published in, 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 in a TMS conference, um, the new chilling strategies that's used. So we, we basically have um, any moderate iron uh, containing alloy uh, to get mechanical properties in upwards of 350 MPA um, uh, for uh, the, this engine block. Now it's a 600 plus horsepower application. But looking at that evolution, uh, the key is, as Corey mentioned, clean metal, but driving the porosity down because fatigue is an issue, particularly in, in, uh, in those applications. And then with the structural components, crash worthiness, this is a challenge that we're dealing with. And it goes back to that the quality, the microstructure, the porosity becomes very important. So there are things like conformal cooling inserts. I, I seem to be echoing what, what Corey has mentioned. He, he brought that up. Uh, we, we're spending a lot of time on conformal cooling inserts and, and trying to help uh, improve our structural components and other, and other uh, high pressure die casting components. There are challenges, there's costs involved with this. Uh, the delicate balance and the key for students to know when you go out into your career is that, yeah, something might be more expensive. It makes it better casting, but does, does your manufacturing equipment last longer 
um, or and or does it make a product that has a price tolerance associated with it? Um, but those are uh, big challenges. What I could add to that, and I, I mean, I want to get into the metallurgical aspect. I mean, you're the, the experts, but uh, I mean, doing everything that you just mentioned and, and meeting the, the challenges that you've ju just mentioned, while at the same time having to uh, make greener products and reduce the carbon footprint and have a higher recycling rate uh, or recycling content. So, I mean, that's an even greater challenge, but I mean, that's also expected from the uh, large uh, consumer products manufacturer. I mean, have greener products, which means increased uh, recycling rates. Yeah, I'll jump back in again as a, a few things that came back into mind. Another challenge is uh, really uh, on the cost side of our business. So, so specific, specifically for those of us here in North America, there is more and more competition from the developing countries. So we have to continue to get more and more efficient and our manufacturing operations to stay competitive and keep that work here, whether it's Canada, the United States, Mexico, et cetera. Um, so we have to both explore these new technologies, but as Rob says, you have to do the business case and make sure that, that you're moving your business in the right direction with, uh, with the technology that you're attempting to implement and go with. So um, the other big process engineering hurdle as we talked about a little bit is really in the recruitment of, of <laughs> new process engineers. Um, you know, as other industries in our the technical age of, of human beings continue to advance, it's harder to recruit that top talent into manufacturing. So, so we do need that talent to come in and help us develop these new technologies mm -hmm. and push our industry forward. Abdullah, um, are you taking the next question? Sure, yeah. Go into the next one. Um, I mean, we'll start off with Rob with this one. Any other tools and techniques that are emerging in the industry? Uh, yes, um, because I, I'm just reading the, the full says because it also includes uh, secondary and primary tools. So, um, yeah, I think we covered a lot of the, the, the technologies that are being implemented into it. I'll jump a little bit back into uh, additive, um, I, again, there's a long runway that this is not, we're talking about half a million parts a year projected to hit close to 3 million by 2023 projected. All right. That that's planned, uh, and, and so forth. Um, CO2 content with that form of manufacturing is very different. Um, not so much in the, the metal side of things, but just, um, a lot of foundries do you have a lot of CO2 output associated with it. There, all of the companies are doing ongoing programs uh, uh, to help meet their ISO 14001 uh, requirements. So to, to, to reduce the impact on the environment. In terms of secondary and primary, there's, there is a lot of work. There's challenges in that that came up uh, with that. Um, uh, simply because we already know for the most part uh, in, the, in terms of the cost effective, and I, I've, I've had to buy a lot of metals, so I know um, cost effectiveness in terms of secondary grades and what you can do with that. Um, iron and, and other trace elements have always been a challenge in, in secondary uh, alloys. Um, the Corvette C8 block that we talked about actually is, is one thing because the iron level is 0.6 and that's a 600 horsepower plus uh, output engine. Um, so there, there's, there are uh, strides that are being made to take secondary, which is low cost, but also low CO, CO2 impact. Um, I mean, in Quebec, there's, there's hydroelectric, but a lot of places that are, are manufacturing aluminum uh, there, there is, uh, you know, some uh, CO2 impact associated with that uh, secondary, which NEMAC does a lot of its own secondary alloy making. So we buy a lot of scrap and we make our alloy. So um, there, there are both cost saving and both environmental uh, initiatives that are continually being uh, implemented as, as critically important uh, tools. So you know, those have to do with manufacturing aluminum casting, not, and the question was, was 
what tools are emerging in, in aluminum manufacturing. And, and we kind of touched on all of those things, but part and parcel is basically cost and environmental impacts, which are ongoing for a, a foundry like NEMAC um, <clears throat> that, that are important. But, but like I said, the, the manufacturing footprint in, in emerging industries, again, long runway, which is additive, and I'm talking serial additive manufacturing, um, we, uh, without getting into details, have looked seriously at what environmental CO2 impacts that that particular industry has. Um, one of the carrots about additive that's different. Unlike a foundry, you can't pick it up and move it. Yet every one of us who have seen an additive machine, for the most part, it is possible to pick it up and move it. Uh, this has an impact here in North America because Corey mentioned, he talked about the cost competitiveness and, and et cetera with doing that. Additive, not in engineering, but, but more in a, a sort of hourly workforce there's a difference in there. And, you know, additive as a tool, whether it's aluminum uh, and the other uh, main metals that are, are, that are printed, it is a lot easier to really stick an additive facility anywhere and not have the same cost in, in other impacts um, that a foundry has or an extruder has. So there's environmental and there are other costs. The thing about additive is that there's a bunch of cost carrots that are not apparent because people look at the upfront costs. And yes, there, there are some applications where the upfront cost is still large and the cycle time is still too long, but there's certain aspects where uh, there's an impact down the road that potentially is uh, important, I, I feel. Um, and, and that's why there, there's quite a bit of work being done in, in, in that uh, uh, field. So, you, you, you know, you got metal casting, environmental cost impacts that are ongoing to make us more competitive. But the disruptive technologies, particularly with that, I, I'm going to just say it again because some people turn around and say, yeah, that's, that's five, 10 years before you see little bits of it. But then I look at BMW. 300,000 parts. Um, they got one vehicle that's got four head of the parts in it now, the, the, the I-8 Roadster. Um, it's gonna creep up on us. It's a disruptive technology. And I think what's gonna help if there's government, there's always government funding to, for, if you could minimize your CO2 impact, obviously with what's going on with the climate, there's gonna be some government money thrown at that. And uh, I, I think additive is gonna get a little bit of a help because of that, but it's also gonna help bring some of that manufacturing back here uh, too. So it's, these are basically what I would say is emerging in the aluminum industry it is both trying to uh, improve cost effectiveness, environmental impact on our current manufacturing processes, but the disruptive technologies have, a, have an even bigger impact Runways out there, it's a little bit long, but we have to keep our eye on it. I guess just to complete on that, and again, going back to the, the scrap, you'll think that I'm stuck with that, but I think better sorting and purification technology, some are emerging, but there's also a big uh, opportunity and challenge there. I mean, there is still way too much uh, post-consumer aluminum that is still being landfilled, and eventually we will have to find a way to reuse it. And again, that's basically having better sorting uh, and purification technologies that are also cost competitive. And it hasn't really been the case so far, but at some point, uh, I, I think we will see an inflection point where it will, uh, it will become cheaper and it will make more sense to simply make more new uh, primary aluminum. Yep, and then, uh, so speaking uh, from my view of the die casting industry, um, you know, there's the low iron alloys, structural alloys. They've been around for a while, but they continue to rapidly grow. Um, and people continue to search for um, those, those alloys that are both, that are, we'll say more, more easily castable, that are less aggressive on the tools, et cetera. Um, 
There's the additive manufacturing side, conformal cooling. We've discussed that some. Um, there's the world of, of really dye materials and dye coatings. Um, so, so looking for better materials that last longer um, and can withstand the, these aggressive processes um, and putting coatings on them to attack uh, that, the, the issues of solder, et cetera. Um, within the world of dye lube, there's things like pulse spray where we're, we're essentially using fuel injectors in our, in our lubrication nozzles to, to cut 70 to 80% of the dye lube out. There's people that have gone the, the other way and gone with an oil-based lube where they're able to cut 70 to 80% of the lube out by going on that method. So there's a lot of, uh, of supporting technologies. It's not the exact maybe casting itself that you're, that you're changing, but it's things that are making us more competitive, more environmentally friendly, um, and, and just in improving um, the overall casting process to make better castings and to make them in a more efficient manner. And I also talked earlier about uh, really the resurgence in semi-solid. So within the last uh, couple of years in the world of die casting, um, there's a company named Comtech, um, as well as one that's uh, named Gisco, and they're both now marketing uh, on-demand slurry systems, so so real casting systems, and um, they've they've may have had a lot of uh, headway from what I've seen in the world of telecom, who looks for really really thin-walled aluminum castings, um, and by making them semi-solid, you get can get better flow links, etc. So there's been a lot of work in that. But those of us in the automotive world that might have a there was initially some some fallout early before semi-solid was maybe ready. It was getting trialed on on components, but we're starting to realize and come back to the benefits of semi-solid and, and reevaluate these, these newer technologies to make our castings better. Um, yeah. So it seems like a lot of looking at every step and then also looking at, you know, every angle of every step sort of, right? You're looking right. at, I'm using a lubricant. How do I, how do I apply it? What kind of lubricant? How much? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So we're looking right. at every step and every angle of each step. Um, I think we'll go Jessica for the next question. And Jessica, you're muted. Thank you, Francois. Just to move on to one of the questions that we talked a bit about when we were advertising this. Um, so I'd like to ask our panelists, directed first at Rob, what advice would you give students currently in their studies on what they need to know? technical, interpersonal, or other topics before they start out in the workplace? A uh, very good question. Um, and actually, this was this, this uh, I, I think the first thing we talked about the networking that that that's always important is, is always to get out there. Um, oddly enough, I'm, I'm one of those students that have never done a co-op. So I understand the value of having something. It was just because of the programs I was in didn't have a, a co-op program. But um, networking with NACA student chapters, AFS, um, TMS. Um, there's a lot of resources, including uh, helps with uh, helping with job searches and resume building, et cetera. Um, and then participating in, in, in those organizations. I think that'd be very important. Um, obviously, you know, try to do well enough in school so that, that option to go on for a master's or a PhD down the road is, is also uh, important. So obviously getting, uh, ensuring your marks are, are up there. Um, I apologize, circle back to the, the AFS and all that sort of stuff. There's scholarship opportunities, of course, a lot of these organizations have. It does look good in, in a resume that they have one or two of those. Uh, sometimes you'll be interviewing with uh, a new employer who, who may be also a metallurgist that uh, has, and they may just recognize, yeah, I, I got that scholarship too when I was a young person. I think in terms of when you when you get that first job and you start working, probably the most important thing, um, because I did, even though I've never done a co-op in my 20 years at NEMAC, I probably had about 30 different co-ops working for me. So I had a, I had a cross section of different students. Um, and, and, and of course, when you finally go for your first job after school, um, I, I, I always try to, to look at it as like, you're still in school. You're just not formally in a school. So treat it that way. Try to learn as much as you can. Um, maybe not wait for somebody to go to your cubicle or your office and say, you really should learn. Try to take a look and, 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 and don't be afraid to do a little bit of 
you know, time after work just to try to understand um, some of the technical challenges and so forth. In terms of the interpersonal, um, uh, do a lot of listening, uh, obviously. <laughs> Uh, the the obvious things of you know pay attention to how your parents raised you just just you know even if you want to pretend your parents are in the room and they want to be proud of you and you know uh, sometimes I you know we've all been in meetings that don't always um, they have certain intensities and I'm kind of wondering if everybody's parents were sitting in the conference room how different a meeting would look but try to pretend that your parents kind of know what's going on and they want to be proud of you and and, and stuff like that. And, and uh, um, you know, th those things are important and, and always try to try to stay positive. Right now with the, uh, right now with, you know, the, the chip shortage and COVID, you know, our industry has had some stresses and, and we all know that it can percolate. It's really important to try to almost do that. And I know at NEMAC, uh, there's even they've they're still starting to offer training programs and on how to work with people. So obviously pay attention to that. And a lot of it follows through in what I just said, except for pretend your parents are in the room watching, <laughs> watching you when uh, uh, you know, uh, it goes a long way. Um, it, it goes a long way in the first couple of years. Um, very curious, cooperative, hardworking, and then people begin to have that trust in you, um, it goes a long way to uh, down the road with promotions and, and stuff like that. If, if they feel like you can handle the heavy boulders on your shoulders when you need to, um, that, that is important. So um, I, I think sometimes students, when they feel school, they, they, they feel like that somehow the hard part's done I think when you go out into the work uh, for uh, workforce, the hard work just continues. It's just a little bit different, um, but uh, you know that that becomes uh, uh, really important. So that that would be the advice that I I would give uh, students and what to expect and, and what to do. Well, what I could add, I mean you will be working with other people. So, I mean, your interpersonal skills are critical. I mean, try to polish them, work on them. I mean, because it is teamwork and everybody has a certain minimum of technical expertise, but you got to be, you got, you got to have the ability to communicate with the others, listen to the others, but also uh, be able to share your ideas. So, I mean, communication skills are extremely important. Uh, don't be afraid to ask questions, even if, if you can't find a mentor. I mean, mentoring is great. And most experienced people will be happy to share their experience and support the, the newcomers. So again, don't sit in your corner. Uh, I mean, be proactive and, and go to the others. And I mean, from my personal experience, uh, have a balanced life. I mean, it's not just work. I mean, Balance your life and be happy at what you're do at what you're doing, and make sure that you do also the other things that are that uh, are a passion to you. I mean, you know, it, it's not just work. And if you have a balanced life, I think you'll be just a a better person to be around with. And again, it's part of the communication skills and interpersonal skills. And I mean, the more people are at ease with you, the the, the more they will go to you, and the more they will reach out to you and get you involved. So be, be someone to be pleasant to work with. Definitely. Um, and then I'll add, uh, so specifically in your, in your graduate education, um, try to find some joy in that, that study that you're doing here. Um, hopefully you've got a topic that's of interest to you. Um, if, you if you're early in your studies and you're finding that it's not quite right, talk to your professor, talk to your mentors, find something that fits you because there'll be long days when you're trying to get your, your thesis done and, and get through it. And you want it to be something where, where you're able to take some personal pride in that work that you're doing and getting to the end of it. You don't want to have to drag yourself into the lab. You want to actually want to spend some extra time and get in there. And that, that kind of attitude will carry over then into your professional life. When, when you're working on something that, that you take some sort of personal satisfaction in that work that you're doing, um, 
it, it, the days go a lot faster. You have a lot more fun. You create fun around you with those that you're working with. You get much better results as well. Um, things move a lot faster that way. Definitely on the interpersonal side, try to try to um, make friends. Understand that the people that you're working with, they we you all have a common goal at the end of the day to to make um, that company that you're working with successful and and move forward within the industry and and. Uh, you know, take some pride in that and those around you share, share your own personal viewpoints and, and where you come from and where you want to go. Um, and you'll find that that many of those align, but some are different, but but you guys can, you'll find uh, that those discussions that you have with people, um, give you a, a different viewpoint on the world that you might not have had otherwise. So, so definitely look for that get out and network as we've as we've talked before, um, both within the industry and outside of the industry, see, see how others see the world and see see the industry that you're working in and um, and let that help shape shape the way that you're going and um, know that uh, some of the you know there'll be there'll be times where it feels like a struggle and you're not sure why you're doing it but know that many around you feel that same way express those feelings and concerns and and uh, things get easier and uh, when you're working as a team and sharing your sharing your thoughts and ideas so Great. I think we got a lot of really excellent advice from our three panelists. Um, Abdallah, if you have anything to add, um, personally, I'd say my advice would be to, if you're working in a factory for the first time, spend time where the operators spend time, eat lunch with the operators, get to know them, get to know their names, ask them what they do, talk to them about their job and, and just watch, watch what they do, watch what happens with the product, watch what gets rejected and what gets accepted and, and just the flow of the factory. And it's very important to get to know it. Abdallah, do you have any tips for people starting out in their Yeah, no, career? I think I echo kind of the same, some of the same things that others have said, um, get to know the people around you, get to know the process. Um, I think I'll, I'll take inspiration. I'm a friend of mine. He did, he wasn't working in a, uh, kind of a manufacturing space, but I think it was still relevant. One of the first things he had to do at his job was to go around everyone else on his floor and just ask them, what do you do here? And then get to, and then so he got to the discussion with each, each employee and you got to hear what they do. And then he got, to, from that, got some conversation, got to know them a little bit. But then he also knew who to reach out to um, if he needed help, right? So he had a, a small sense of what everyone did. So he knew if he had a particular problem, who might be the best person to reach out to. So I thought something like that, and I think a lot of us are kind of echoing that same statement of get to know who is around you, get to um, uh, make friends with the people around you, and then you get a better sense of how to work in a team and uh, who can help you with problems and who you can help to with their problems. A famous uh, management expert from McGill, Henry Mintzberg, uh, basically uh, put together the concept of management by walking around, which has always <laughs> proven to be successful. I think it's excellent advice. Um, that's the only way to stay in the communications loop, I've found. Just spend time walking around. Um, so we're going to take, uh, in five minutes, we're going to move into our breakout rooms. So I'd like to just take a moment to thank our all three panelists for their time and expertise. I'd like to thank our attendees for attending. Um, I hope you fill out the survey, but please don't leave because we're all, you're all going to be sorted into a room automatically. There'll be one panelist, one moderator, and one third of the attendees. You are allowed to shift to a different room. Please direct message your moderator and they will move you over. The breakout rooms will last for half an hour and we will extend this time for an additional 30 minutes if people are still interested. So now we're going to have a five minute break and we'll see you in five minutes in the breakout rooms. <laughs>